All right, guys, so we're going to do uh, chapter 21 uh, now, which is page 431 in your book, Property Taxes. So property taxes are a necessary evil, um, something that, you know, everybody, if they own real estate, is going to pay. Um, now, you might be wondering, what does my money go towards for property taxes? And it's a question they ask on the test sometimes. You know, what do property taxes fund? And the answer is they fund the majority of local services. So the ma large majority of your local services that your town provides to you are funded via property taxes. So things like schools, police departments, fire departments, recreation, fields, recreation departments, town employees, like the Department of Public Works and things like that, um, finance primarily in most towns through property taxes. Now, with property taxes, the way the town goes about figuring out what your property tax bill is, really essentially they say, we need X amount of dollars from property tax revenue to run our town this year. Then they figure out all the assessed values of all the homes in town, and they say, okay, what percentage of all the assessed values is that equal? Whatever that percentage happens to be is what they said is the tax rate. Let's say the tax rate was 2%. If your home is invested a million bucks, 2% of that is 20,000. I'm gonna pay $20,000 in annual property taxes there. Now, what if I don't pay my tax bill? If I don't pay my property tax bill, the town still needs this money. So what they do is they auction off a property tax lien, and anybody can bid on that. And basically, the people who win, let's say I bid on that and I win the property tax lien, I'm now paying your property taxes for you. Let's say I bid 16% interest on that, and you owe $10,000. Now when you pay the town back, you're paying the town back $10,000 plus 16% annualized interest. It's a win-win for everybody maybe perhaps even you as a delinquent you know, taxpayer, the town gets their money, I you know, now get a 16% annualized return on my money, and you get a delay on paying your property taxes back. You'll have to pay an additional fee when you pay them back, but it's a lot to delay paying your property tax bill. Um, however, if you don't pay your property tax bill, they place a property tax lien on your home. And that property tax lien is the first priority lien. It takes precedence over all liens. So if they were to ask you about property tax liens, property tax liens, first priority liens, they take precedence over all liens. And then um, on the left side here of 431, talk about the assessed value. So again, the way the town figures out your property tax bill, they take your assessed value, multiply times your tax rate. So if your assessed value is $800,000 and your tax rate was 2%, in this case, your annual property tax bill is $16,000. So if you think you're paying too much in property taxes, the only thing you can challenge is just strictly the assessed value. You cannot challenge a tax rate. That tax rate is uniform throughout the town. The only thing you can challenge is just the assessed value. So if they were to ask you, what can you appeal with your property taxes, you can only appeal your assessed value. Now, as we move along here and turn to the next page, page 432 here, it talks about equalization. So for equalization, um, I don't have a marker here or I'd write this on the board. Equalization is the concept of assessing your home at a percentage of value. So to give you an example here, let's say your home's fair market value is a million bucks, but they're going to assess you at an equalization rate at 80% of value. 80% of a million bucks is 800,000. Now if your tax rate's 2%, your annual property tax bill is going to be $16,000. Why does the town do that? If your home's worth a million bucks, why would they assess it at a percentage of value? Why would they assess it at $800,000? The reason they do that, mostly, is because you can only appeal your assessed value. So if they artificially lower your assessed value by assessing you at a percentage of value, that's probably going to decrease the chance of somebody trying to file, and file a tax appeal. Whereas if they were to assess you right at market value, and your market value happened to drop, let's say, you know, they might get away from the tax appeal. They don't want that. If they're successful, they might have a shortfall in their budget. So that's the equalization concept. It's, it's assessing homes at a percentage of value. Um, and then on the bottom left here of 432, it talks about special property tax treatment. So it goes over senior citizens here. So if you're a senior citizen, which in this circumstance, they need to be age 65 plus. So if you're 65 or older, and you make less than $10,000 a year, excluding Social Security income, you can then take a whopping $250 off of your property tax bill. So if you're a senior citizen and this is your personal residence and you make less than $10,000 a year, excluding Social Security income, 
you can then take $250 off of your tax bill. If you're a veteran, if you're a veteran who's been honorably discharged from the military, you then take $250 off of your property tax bill as well. And then if we go to page 433, it talks about special assessment taxes here. So special assessment taxes, these are levied specifically against benefiting property owners for things like street improvements and road repairs. So if they were to ask you what type of taxes might be levied against benefiting property owners for things like street improvements and road repairs, it's special assessment taxes. So examples would be curbs, sidewalks, uh, you know, things like that. The curb or sidewalk outside your house is in awful shape. Maybe it's a sidewalk because your kid took a sledgehammer to it and destroyed it. The town can fix that, but rather, take, rather than taking it out of the general operating fund, um, what the town can opt to do is they can opt to say, hey, we're just putting it on your tax bill because it's your fault, and we're issuing this special assessment tax. So again, special assessment taxes are levied against benefiting property owners. Uh, could be for things like street improvements, road repairs, curbs, sidewalks, you know, things like that. And then we talk here about the tax aspects of real estate ownership. So what are the two main tax deductions that you have when you own a home? Property taxes and mortgage interest. Now there's limitations on these, and some of them have been recently revised, and we don't have to know the limitations on them, but you know, those are two of the, um, two of the main tax deductions, property tax and mortgage interest. So let's say, for example, your property tax amount was $4,000, and your mortgage interest was, let's say, $5,000. Um, how much can you deduct against your income? $9,000 in that circumstance. So property taxes and mortgage interest, uh, they are tax deductible. So let's turn the page here. Let's go to 434. <coughs> on 434, on the bottom left here, it gets into capital gains taxes. So for capital gains tax, first and foremost, just to know what a capital gains tax is, it's taking your sales price minus either your basis or adjusted basis and it's a fancy way of calling it your profit. Your basis is your original purchase price. Your adjusted basis is the original purchase price plus improvement. So let's say, for example, I sold the house for $600,000. I bought it for $400,000. I did no work. What's my profit? What's my capital gain there? $200,000. What if I bought it for $400,000? I did $100,000 with the capital improvement, but I put a small little addition on. Now, my basis was four hundred, but I did $100,000 with the capital improvement, so my adjusted basis is five hundred. So now, what I do is I take my sales price of six hundred minus five hundred, and my taxable capital gain is $100,000 in that circumstance. To figure out your capital gain, you take your sales price minus either your basis or adjusted basis. Your basis is the original purchase price. Adjusted basis is the original purchase, purchase price plus improvement. You'd always want to use the high, higher number. The higher number shows the lower gain, the lower profit, which is going to be taxed. So that's what a capital gain is to begin with. That's how you would figure it out. Now, what we talked about here is the capital gains tax exemption. What are you exempt from paying capital gains taxes? Well, a couple rules that first have to be met. Number one, in order to claim the capital gains tax exemption, the property must have served as your principal residence for at least two of the prior five years. So number one, the property must have served as your principal residence for at least two of the prior five years. And number two, you cannot have claimed a capital gains tax exemption on another property in the prior two year span. Because you could have two separate properties that served as your principal residence for at least two of the prior five years, right? So in order for you to claim this, you cannot have claimed this on another property in the prior two year span. If that holds true, if this property has served as your principal residence for at least two of the prior five years, and you have not claimed this on another property in the prior two year span, then if you're a single filer for tax purposes, you're exempt up to a $250,000 capital gain. So you can make up to $250,000 basically on the sale of your home and not to pay a capital gains tax on that. If you're a married filer for tax purposes, you're exempt up to a $500,000 capital gain, as long as those first two criteria have been met, as we spoke about. Those two criteria, the property must have served as your principal residence for at least two of the prior five years, and you cannot have claimed this on another property in the prior two years span. So if we move along to page 435 here, 
we talk about depreciation. Depreciation, um, what that basically does, that would allow you to gradually uh, depreciate your improvements to the real estate over their useful life. Now, for depreciation, they might ask you, what can you depreciate? You can only depreciate <laughs> the improved or the building value of income producing properties. So number one, you can only depreciate either the improved or the building value of income producing properties. You can't depreciate the land value and things like that. You can only depreciate just the building or the improved value of income producing property. Um, now, if you do so on a straight line basis, for residential properties, you can do so over 27 and a half years. For a commercial, you can do so over 39 years, if you just do it on a straight line basis. Now, there's ways you can accelerate this, perhaps do what's called the 100% bonus depreciation, cost segregation, you know, accelerated depreciation. But we don't have to go into too much detail on that now. Know the basics, though. You can depreciate the improved value of income producing property, and you do it lazy, you know, in a lazy manner on a straight line basis for residential over 27 and a half years, for commercial over 39. And then on the top right here at 435, it talks about the useful life of the property. So um, the economic life is another way of saying that is the useful life of the property. It's the period of time which you can expect some kind of positive return on your investment. One thing they could also ask about this, if the value of your land and building equals just the value of land, what does that say about the economic life? The economic life would have come to an end. If the value of land and building equals the, just the value of land, they're telling you the building's worthless, it's not worth anything. So in this case, um, the economic life would have come to an end. So the economic life, again, is the useful life of the property. Let's turn the page here, go to 436. On 436 here, it talks about a 1031 exchange. So what a 1031 exchange is, it, they'll either say it's a tax-deferred or a tax-favored exchange of like-kind investment properties. You can't use this for your personal residence. It's a tax-deferred or a tax-favored exchange, like you're trading basically one property for another. Tax-deferred or tax-favored exchange of like-kind investment property. So in other words, I'm selling one investment property, and within a certain period of time, I'm taking the sale proceeds from that and applying it to another investment property. So some of the rules behind this 1031 is you're basically trading one property for another. The property you're selling, we call that the relinquished property. The property you're replacing it with we call the replacement property. So some of the rules that go along with this, the property that you're selling, the relinquished property, within 45 days of selling the relinquished property, I must identify up to three replacement properties. And of the three I identify, I have to close on one of them within 180 days of selling the relinquished property. So it's not 45 and then 180, it's 180 total, and in the first 45, you'd have to identify a replacement property. So again, Within 45 days, you would have to identify a replacement, and within 180, you would have to close on the replacement. Now, also, during this exchange period, when I sell the relinquished property, I can't take the sale proceeds and put them in my bank account and then apply them towards the next purchase. I can't touch that money. That money must be held on to by a QI, a qualified intermediary. So again, a QI, a qualified intermediary, a qualified intermediary they hold on to the funds during the exchange period. And if you want to take any of that money, you can, that's fine. But if you take some of that money, it's taxable. I mean, call that a boot. A boot is anything taxable with a 1031 exchange. So if they were to ask you about a boot, a boot is anything that is taxable with a 1031 exchange. You have cash boots, which is I take out cash and I put it in my pocket. You also have what's called a mortgage boot. And in a 1031, what it says, is the replacement property must have more debt placed on it than the relinquished property. Meaning that if the property I'm selling has a loan balance debt on it of two million bucks, the property I'm replacing it with must have debt on it of at least two million bucks. Um, and that's what we mean by that. So, and again, let's say for example, um, the property I sold had debt of two million and the property I replaced it with has debt of 1.5, that's $500,000 less. So essentially what I have to do is pay you know, taxes as if there was like a $500,000 gain in essence. So you're supposed to place more debt on the replacement property as well. Um, and then if we uh, turn the page here, go to page 438. Talk about tax credits here. 
So in regards to tax credits, if they were to ever ask you on the test, what's more valuable, a tax credit or a tax deduction, tax credits are more valuable. Let's give an example. Let's say somebody makes $100,000 and they get a $25,000 tax deduction. That would simply mean that they're now just taxed as if they made $75,000. Their new taxable income is $75,000. Let's say somebody who makes $100,000 gets a $25,000 tax credit. Let's assume that person who makes $100,000, they pay 30% of their income to the government. That means they have a $30,000 tax bill. If you have a $25,000 tax credit, you take $25,000 right off of that $30,000 tax bill. And now, your income tax amount due is only $5,000. So that's what I mean by tax credits are far more valuable than tax deductions. Um, and that's, uh, that's chapter 21 there. That's the property tax chapter. So as always, if you guys have any questions on any, any of the information in this chapter, uh, feel free to email me. My email is kylecovets at gmail.com. Thank you.